Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar on the changes in the Indian merger control regime, uh, which have taken place over the last year, but more so also in the month of September 2024. Uh, today, we are going to consider what uh, these changes are, what the impact of these changes on deal making would be, and what really the way forward is for merger control in India. Uh, joining me today uh, are our three of my partners, Lawyers Par Excellence, Mr. Manas Chaudhary, Ms. Anisha Chand, and Mr. Pranjal Pratik. Uh, I'm Anshuman Sakli, and the four of us uh, are partners in the competition and antitrust practice at Khetan & Co. in Mumbai and Delhi. The agenda for today literally is uh, to consider the changes in the merger control regime, but just to give a little snapshot of uh, what all we would be covering in the next 50 odd minutes, Uh, we'd look at the revised notification thresholds, how they are, uh, what kind of changes we are now seeing in the in the, in the revised notification regime, uh, thresholds, the, the key amendments in terms of uh, what the uh, what changes are being brought about for uh, Indian, in the Indian Indian merger control regime, what implications financial sponsors will see, uh, and how deal making would be impacted for them, uh, what the impact for digital market players really would be as well. Uh, a little bit of trends and the year that has gone past and going forward what really the engagement strategy for uh, the cci and merger control cases really would be uh, of course we are very happy to take questions uh, from you uh, please do uh, use the chat box in the in the portal to to uh, send across your questions we'll try and take up as many questions as we can towards the end of this uh, webinar and if you are unable to take any questions during the webinar itself we will definitely get back to you over email so uh, just going uh, straight up into the into the uh, into the agenda for today uh, uh, manasur i'd just like to ask you before we get into specifics and the changes that we are seeing right now uh, indian merger control regime has been effective since uh, 2011 now uh, could you give us a little snapshot of how uh, the merger control regime has really fared over the years. Uh, what are the key changes? How exactly has the response been from the industry to the uh, merger control regime since 2011? Thank you, Anshuman. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are participating on this webinar. We are very happy to really share the changes which have had happened, but the specific question asked to me by Anshuman is very interesting. Because in the year 2011, we saw a lot of discussions, deliberations were going on in India, especially with regard to the Industrial Chamber of Commerce and Industry as to whether or not the Indian merger control regime should be notified or not. Because the moot problem with the industry was the 210 days waiting period. They were all scared that how can I really wait for seven months to get an approval of a transaction which is non-adversarial. So that got demystified with the evolution of the law. 1st June 2011, we saw the notification of merger control of Section 5 and 6 were made by the Government of India. From there on, with the passage of time and as the transactions were being filed before the CCI, since it's a sector agnostic legislation, so sectors from all walks of the Indian industry were being notified from time to time. And CCI being the only agency to really look into the combinations of the Competition Act, they were also extra careful that it should not really cause any apprehensions which were hitherto being raised by the industry should really be translated into reality. So naturally, there were pressure from both sides as the parties were to really go in and get the notification filed within 30 days. That was the regime at that point in time, which subsequently in June of 2017 got amended and it became a little easier for the industry. So what I'm trying to say here is very simple that with the evolution of the law, and with the participation of the external lawyers representing the parties, the government of India and CCI, all were converging to making more and more changes, making the filing easier for the industry. And in the process, the law started evolving in a direction which the entire industry at the initial stage had the apprehensions were getting eased out with the passage of time. <clears throat> the most interesting thing which came during the course of this journey until today to my mind, one was the amendments made in between. One was that 30 days waiting period on, in June of 2017 got uh, 
almost uh, deleted. The parties were able to now file within any time after they have agreed to go for a combination. That 30 days, uh, you know, at that point in time, even a belated filing used to be called a gun jumping, which obviously was not the intent of the legislation. And naturally, that also got eased out subsequently. The de minimis notification also was issued by the government of India under that special provision of the Competition Act in public interest. That also helped that most of the transactions which were coming within the ambit of the de minimis with regard to the targets thresholds in India were not to be notified. And that also gave a lot of opportunities for the parties to really have some comfort with regard to filing. Came August of 2019, precisely 14th August 2019, the government of India along with the CCI came up with a very interesting departure from the filing that is called Green Channel. So Green Channel was in fact actually was a complete notification which required the parties to notify to pay the filing fee. Yet the competition assessment part was not required to be done if the parties to the notice were able to show to the CCI that there would not be any overlap of horizontal market, vertical market or complementary market. So this also helped having a extensive uh, preference with the parties. And if we see the statistics until say last year, there are almost about 25% of the total filings which were made in one year, those were all green channel notifications. So that clearly gives a departure to the earlier waiting period part. So the basic crux Anshuman to my mind was in June of 2011 when we were participating in the discussions with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs along with the CCI as we were the only antitrust lawyer then in India and all our peers also participated in those discussions. We always found that the industry chambers were very much worried about the 210 waiting days. So that ultimately the average time period if I look today it is between 25 and 45 working days for not complicated mergers and the mergers which are little complicated it goes little beyond 45 working days to whatever days now the question arises has cci ever reached the 210 days in this life cycle the answer is emphatic no unless the parties have not been able to respond to the rfis on time because of the complexity of the transaction or because there were some problems say for example i remember the cement uh, whole same Lafarge matter got delayed because there was a lot of amendment to be made in the Mines Act. And at that point in time, because of an externalities of a Mines Act, which is causing the modification as directed by the CCI to be completed by an external monetary agency. So that was some exceptional cases. Otherwise, you know, Sun Renbaxi matter also got into phase two. There was divestment, even it did not take 210 days. So what I'm trying to say here is that it is a very positive kind of a merger control regime. No blocking so far out of say about 1204 odd uh, approvals as on today. So there are about say insignificant two to three percent which have gone into modification route. Rest all are approved without any conditions. So I think the more amendments which have been introduced in April of 2023 and notified subsequently until up to 10th of September 2024, my co-panelists will be taking you through all of those newer changes, which are a mix of challenges plus more opportunities for the industry. And I stop here. I would like to answer if there are any questions on that. And I over to you, Anshuman. Before others have questions, I have one question. Uh, you did mention the the, the concept of uh, public interest uh, in in uh, under which the commission. Uh, unfortunately, not the commission, the, the government itself came up with the de minimis exemption. Uh, we often get asked this question as to whether, apart from actual genuine competition concerns, does perhaps public interest or maybe even national security play a part in how merger control proceedings really pan out before the CCI? So, so what's your take on that? So if I just give you a specific answer to the question, one is, say, for example, the exemptions of the rural banks from coming within the ambit of competition merger. So if you see today the rural banks of India, when it is compared with the bigger public sector and private banks of India, there even market share and percentage into the penetration of the banking division of India is very insignificant. So almost it comes within the ambit of the de minimis kind of a situation. 
that why should a small bank which is trying to expand by economic efficiency standards why should it unnecessarily get entangled into some kind of a regulatory oversight that's my take on that on the contrary when this mopng uh, exemptions were granted to the combination of the oil marketing companies with say ongc and hpcl i thought that that was perhaps not a correct exemption it should have really got an oversight of the cci because ultimately there are private players who would also like to see that the competition is not distorted by granting a blanket approval without a public in the, within the garb of the public interest uh, considerations that's my personal view people may have different views on that with regard to national security i think uh, there is not a single issue as on today with regard to national security as a transaction between parties before the cci but at the same time there is no blanket ban to that in india and if i can draw a correlation with this kind of a situation i remember the covid period of uh, april 29 uh, 2020 when the cci wanted to have certain exemptions with regard to filings under the antitrust portion and it immediately coincided with similar kind of notifications being issued by eu and other mature jurisdictions with regard to giving some benefits to the enterprises in the face of a covid pandemic so if i just correlate that national security is a concern in several jurisdictions perhaps but it has not yet seen the light of the day in india and if at all it happens to be like that say for example we can also talk about something with regard to uh, other exemptions also but to my mind national security is not specifically prohibited from being considered by the cci it may depending on the facts and circumstances on a case to case basis so if i try to correlate the rural bank and pub, uh, mopng sector and national security i still get a flavor that it would be more dependent upon case to case basis got it that's helpful to know uh, moving to anisha uh, anisha we've uh, of course seen a bunch of changes in the thresholds uh, come up uh, what are the challenges that you believe the legislature is trying to uh, to 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 correct here or or uh, what are the challenges which prompted the legislature to introduce these changes that we are seeing and uh, could you also take us through the revised thresholds and uh, how they would apply in in transactions going forward sure thanks thanks for that anshuman um if uh, you can move to the next slide why don't i answer your first your second question first and tell you a little bit about the old thresholds which have been now recast into a new sort of avatar. So what we had earlier this year is what we popularly call the de minimis thresholds or the small target exemption thresholds. These are essentially local nexus criteria which presupposes that if the target does not meet a prescribed asset or turnover criteria, then it does not, the acquisition of that target is not going to result, it, result in any alteration of any market dynamics. And therefore, therefore, by definition, they are sort of excluded from a merger review. Uh, and these were earlier 350 crores and 1000 crores uh, in terms of local Indian assets in Indian turnover. And these were then revised um, in March of 2024 to 450 and, uh, of assets and 1250 crores of revenue in India. And, and subsequent sort of not subsequently actually contemporaries, we, uh, contemporaneously, uh, we also saw a revision, upward revision of the section five thresholds, which are eight asset and um, turnover based thresholds based on parties assets and turnover and their groups uh, assets and turnover so they also saw a almost 25 percent jump uh, and and the law actually allows for uh, for the government to actually revise these thresholds based on economic parameters so now these are uh, were, were done as a result of notifications. They were valid for a period of two years. Now what we have is uh, the law itself, as you know, as you said in the beginning, there have been a lot of amendments. The law now itself codifies this uh, as a reality. And therefore now these have been packaged in the form of minimum asset and turnover rules. It's uh, the numbers remain the same. Nothing really changes. It's sort of like uh, old by new bottle uh, but but the only difference is they're now packaged differently so these continue to exist 
now in terms of what has changed and why it has changed if you can just maybe move to the next slide is uh, we have this new animal uh, called the deal value threshold and the reason why india thought that it was important to have a deal value criteria or deal value threshold is uh, similar to what most regulators are thinking globally uh, that the reason why this has come into being the way in the manner and shape that it has is because it was felt that there's a perceived enforcement gap uh, and a lot of transactions which were high value transactions uh, more so in the tech space were not going to the commission for their review the the and and these were acquisitions of large targets who were very innovative who commanded enormous valuations but they were escaping scrutiny why because we had the old conventional thresholds based on assets and turnover uh, and not necessarily in these sort of uh, sectors in the tech space it's not necessary that the revenue that you derive is truly representative of the competitiveness or uh, the market power that one derives uh, and that is why it was thought that we need a new test where we are able to catch these transactions that may have significant repercussions in the Indian contest. India is obviously not the first one to join uh, to, to pioneer this. Uh, it's sort of tried, not sure fully tested yet. But there are there is Austria, Germany, who's uh, dabbled with this sort of a law already. US had a size of transaction test for a while so it's not a completely novel concept but of course it has been indianized or or there are certain local uh, nuances that have been added so with that background very quickly i'll tell you what the deal value threshold is it is if your value of transaction is more than 2000 crores um, in indian rupees uh, which is roughly 220 240 depending on the forex exchange value uh, usd million if you have a transaction size of more than that and the in the target has substantial india operations again there's a local nexus if you can see attached to even the deal value threshold then your transaction is potentially notifiable and the de minimis test that we spoke about in the previous slide is not going to apply to this these are independent mutually exclusive tests you have to now run two tests one is under your target exemption plus your statutory thresholds under section 5 and the, the other is the deal value threshold so you know you you can't overlap and say that oh deal value is exceeding 2000 but i get de minimis so i'm exempt that will there's no interaction that way they're separate uh, right so just coming back to how to identify the value of transaction it's a very broad based definition it has multiple components if you can see on the screen the value of transaction can include cash as well as non-cash components so in a deal where you have a cash plus stock for instance uh, sort of a consideration both the elements will be considered anything which is based on future contingencies like call options is something that you need to consider today while evaluating your deal and that can result in a lot of uncertainty any consideration that you have uh, agreed separately on and very commonly we give this example of non-compete fee for the exit exiting promoter uh, right that needs to be included so there are lots of all the transactions which are interconnected and any consideration that is payable for each has to be included any transaction that you do within a two-year period span between the same uh, acquirer and target group has to be included so it's sort of uh, it's sort of catch-all in that sense and the law also goes one step ahead and says that look if you're in doubt please file uh right and the idea is that you are not able to structure transactions in and slice and dice them to circumvent the filing required which is why it's been very carefully crafted uh and 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 you know to, to make sure that the, the kind of deals that should be notified are notified um and and that's on that if you can go to the next slide i'll just explain to you what substantial india operations is uh, and this is again very important because there are two elements one is the value of the transaction plus the sboi test so you your value of the transaction globally may exceed this number and look very puny but if the target does not meet the substantial india operations test then you are still exempt um, so it's sort of a de minimis designed for the deal value threshold right but um, so what is sboi as as i said in the beginning the the rationale was uh, of the deal value threshold was that uh, transactions in the tech space 
specifically uh, were were not being notified there were a lot of what we call very colloquially killer acquisitions in that space which is why if you see the criteria here you can see that there is a, there's a separate criteria for digital enterprises digital services and other services so digital and non digital so what is the criteria for a digital service when is sboi met if the target entity is involved in rendering digital services and that's also very widely defined it can mean any activity that you're rendering by way of internet um, and and that doesn't have to be for consideration that can be a digital service so the ambit is very very wide uh, but 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 if you are offering digital services and if your user base in india is at least 10 percent or more of the global user base and user base can be end users or business users then you're meeting the criteria if uh, you have more than 10 percent revenue or turnover from india uh, you're meeting the criteria if your gmv is more than 10 percent you meet the criteria if you're a digital user if you're not a digital service provider sorry if you're a non-digital service provider then the first criteria is not applicable to you at all so user base you don't have to look at what you then have to test is turnover whether your turnover is more than 10 percent and there is a minimum revenue criteria of 500 crores which is roughly about 60 million us dollars so you need to have more than 10 percent of your gmb from india plus you need to have uh, more than 500 crores of revenue uh, gmb from india and the same thing is applicable for um, the uh, revenue criteria 10 percent or more of revenue from india plus 500 crores of minimum revenue in india so as you can see uh, the focus here is more on the tech deals which is why there's a separate category of tests which have been um, mentioned and prescribed for digital users um, another thing of note is uh, which is i think very business friendly india was uniquely positioned in that sense but the turnover definition has also been upgraded uh, it still relates to revenue from rendering goods and services but what it very clearly now excludes is export turnover so if you're sitting in india and exporting uh, your services or goods outside india that will not be included as india turnover your intra-group revenue uh, trade discounts all of that can be excluded um right digital services i already told you it's a very wide definition can include a lot of things every uh, every brick and mortar uh, business also has an internet presence today which it may not be monetizing but it has presence so one has to very carefully navigate all of these uh, challenges uh, because you know sometimes the law intends something but there could always be unintended consequences so what just one needs to be very careful whether you know you're meeting that criteria or not and gmv uh, again routinely understood to be in the context of mostly e-commerce could also have a wider interpretation so you know areas that you sort of need to be careful about some of the practical considerations if you can move to the next slide please uh here would be yeah let me take the first point first so first is uh it was a bit of a bolt from the uh, from the blue but uh and it sort of created some controversy for deal value threshold there is a there is uh for you know the law came into force uh from with effect from 10th september 2024 but what it clearly says is deals which have been signed prior to 10th september but not fully closed need to take approval for the limbs of the transaction that have not closed so basically a partially closed transaction even if it is signed prior to 10th september needs to take a cci approval if your dvt is met uh, for the limbs or for the transaction steps which are not fully closed yet uh, this sort of was created a stir in the honest nest sort of a thing but uh, but that's the law i think initially there was a lot of flutter because a lot of deals uh, you know were clear and suddenly there were concerns that their deal time closing timelines would be pushed uh, but hopefully now the dust is sort of settling uh, but th this is what the provision says so if you have existing deals uh, which are underway which have not fully closed it it may be important for you to just take a step back and evaluate uh, you know where your transaction is headed based on the new law uh, thankfully there is also clarity in the law it came in the form of faqs that for deals which become notifiable as a result of this law for the limbs that have been closed 
uh, there will be no gun jumping penalty. So that way they've been sort of fair. Uh, for the limbs that have been closed, I didn't know my deal was notifiable, so I have closed those steps. There will be no penalty, but I still have to notify the steps that I haven't closed. So it's sort of a balancing act there. And uh, the third point is uh, something that I mentioned before. Uh, if you don't have certainty in calculation of the deal value, one has to defer to uh, any board decisions or approving authority decisions and if that also cannot be estimated with reasonable certainty uh, you should just go ahead and file uh, and not take that risk and the fourth one also um, just to sort of repeat if you're if you're breaching the deal value threshold then the benefit of the de minimis small target exemption will not apply to you uh, because that will just defeat the purpose of the new law uh, back to you Anshuman Thanks, Anisha. Seems to be a fairly practical uh, threshold uh, which has been put in place. Uh, of course, uh, as you said, I think time will uh, give a little more clarity in terms of how the application really is. But uh, at least the definition of turnover appears to be uh, quite business friendly as well and uh, perhaps and possibly should reduce the number of uh, filings uh, at the commission as well and would only require more uh, India specific transactions to get uh, notified so that that should again be uh, considered to be a fairly business friendly move uh, staying with the theme of business friendly i think uh, just coming to pranjal now uh, pranjal open market purchases have generally been a sticky wicket until now and uh, the recent amendments do bring about uh, some changes to the manner in which open market purchases are now to be examined and uh, and, and conducted so could you take the audience through the changes relating to open markets and how they would really impact deal making as well Thanks, Anshuman. And before I kick off, warm welcome to our friend from across the globe. Now on open market purchases and uh, open offers, I think these two areas, uh, there has been a long standing demand from the industry that uh, there should be derogation of, uh, you know, standstill obligations for these kind of transactions, especially uh, given that uh, these are to be, these are price sensitive transactions and you cannot space them out uh, for a CCI approval. And we had umpteen number of cases over the years from 2013 uh, to, to now uh, where we've seen CCI impose gun jumping penalties in, uh, in, in most of those cases. And, uh, you know, parties try to make very creative arguments that these are ordinary cost transactions or these are solely as an investment. Uh, there were there were uh, cases where uh, you know there were open market uh, purchases followed by a nomination on the board, but but CCI you know uh, sort of pierced the wheel and sort of saw through all of those uh, methods and uh, and imposed gun jumping penalties on those kind of cases. So now the law formally codifies that one uh, one can implement open offers and market purchases uh, and there will be no gun jumping penalties as long as you meet uh, certain conditions and the most important of which is of course you need to go and file to the cci but that needs to be that you can do within 30 days of uh, the first of such acquisitions that you undertake on the market and uh, other than that uh, the, the cci would require you that you do not exercise any strategic rights as attached to those shares, uh, you will not exercise voting rights on ordinary matters, except for liquidation and insolvency relating proceedings. And you will only enjoy economic rights associated with the shares and one cannot, for example, uh, dividends or any other, uh, you know, profit distribution through shares, but one cannot uh, exercise other rights attached to the uh, shares, especially strategic rights attached to such shares. So this is uh, quite welcome uh, in the past parties also tried to argue, uh, you know, they, they use escrow mechanism, uh, but uh, that also, uh, you know, did not impress CCI. Uh, and uh, therefore, you know, this kind of clear rule that now there is clear derogation possible meeting some very objective criteria is really a welcome move. Thanks, Pranjal. This is definitely something which I think the industry would be happy about. Uh, another point which uh, which I want to take uh, your thoughts on was the timelines which have been considered even further. 
until now, uh, as, as Manas also mentioned in the beginning, the biggest concern when the merger control regime was implemented was how much time would the regulator take in clearing transactions as such. But until now, at least it's been it's been fairly it's been fairly good, and we haven't received too many complaints over the years. Uh, and we have generally seen the commission in most global transactions to be one of the first antitrust regulators to to, to provide its uh, approval. Uh, what changes have been brought about on the timelines in the in the current uh, amendments and uh, how do you think that will impact deal making as well do you think it's all rosy or is are there some thorns as well yeah uh, so on timelines uh, if you could just move to the next slide so we have got a nice little graphic for you here so you see uh, definitely the timelines uh, have been decreased statutorily uh, earlier the cci would form its a prime efficiency view whether a transaction causes appreciable adverse effect within 30 working days and uh, or or it would approve the transaction within those 30 working days first up but now uh, that timeline has been reduced to 30 calendar days and and the overall outer timeline to clear the deal including all aspects of phase one and phase two uh, proceedings uh, has been uh, decreased from 210 calendar days to 150 calendar days uh, so on the outside, it looks really good. Uh, it looks like a move which is created for, uh, you know, towards the aim of uh, ease of doing business in India. But if you look at it more closely and you go through the regulations, uh, it, it appears that, the, you know, the timelines uh, would more or less remain similar to what we had seen in the past. And that is primarily driven by the fact that there is an additional layer of clock stop that the uh, commission has uh, built in. So now when a filing, formal filing is made to the CCI, it will have a 10 working day window first up to review the form and scrutinize it and to ask uh, the parties to sort of uh, address any uh, gaps that they see uh, in their responses. And in case they do find that there are gaps in, the, in that first 10 working days, the clock uh, restarts to day zero. And uh, and once the parties then file uh, the reject form with those missing informations included, that's when the clock starts again. And even after that, the CCI has another set of clock stops, uh, which is usual where they can ask for additional information from parties uh, regarding the transaction. So that also will continue to uh, lead to clock stops. And then finally, if they ask any other additional parties for any information uh, during the review phase, that will also lead to clock stops. So all in all, I believe with the amount of clock stops built into the entire system, the timelines involved will be more or less pretty much similar to what we had seen in the past. Uh, definitely, because there are shorter timelines statutorily, CCI will be in uh, a little bit of pressure. Uh, so we can expect more clock stops, first of all, because they are anyway now armed with uh, such power, uh, but also higher risk of invalidations because, uh, uh, you know, uh, CCI has a track record of clearing cases uh, officially in 17 to 21 working days or so. Uh, you know, they wouldn't want that to take a hit. So uh, where they see that... Uh, the the you know the data is not very forthcoming they will continue to invalidate such notices so all in all uh, it looks good on the outside but in terms of the timelines overall timelines of the uh, on a deal involved practically it should play out pretty much the same way got it that that's very helpful uh, i'll stick around with you for one more uh, set of uh, questions here and, and that's again uh, on, on exemptions. We've already had a bunch of exemptions in the combination regulations previously and those exemptions were basically informal exemptions which allowed parties uh, to, to not file with the commission or seek its approval because there was an inherent assumption that those transactions do, wouldn't lead to any appreciable adverse effect to competition in India. So what happens to those exemptions now? And that's the first part of the question. The second one actually is more on the green channel itself. Uh, the green channel has been extremely popular over the last few years uh, do any of the changes that have been brought about now would they really impact how the green channel is assessed and and how do you see the future of the green channel because of the changes which have been brought about right now so sure. thanks i think uh, we should go 
one by one and i'll start off uh, with the exempted combinations now so uh, many of you would be aware that these set of informal ex uh, previously they were informal set of exemptions now they have been formalized they have been codified the law itself provides power uh, to the ministry of corporate affairs to uh, come up with rules uh, for exempting certain kinds of transactions and now the ministry has also come up with the set of rules uh, so in terms of the overall picture of exempted combinations they are largely the same uh, in, if at all i think uh, these changes are good for certainty uh, there is more objectivity behind all of these uh, regulations now the wordings are clearer than before so uh, it's a it's a welcome change although not uh, you know and there are no drastic set of new uh, exemptions that have been included in the uh, in the new uh, rules that we have now so if you go one by one uh, the first one on ordinary course of business we previously had this exemption as well but now uh, very objectively the rules state that uh, ordinary course of business transaction exemptions will apply only to three scenarios and those are where the, uh, there is share acquisition uh, by underwriter or there is share acquisition by stock brokers or, or by mutual funds. Interestingly, there is a threshold. So previously we didn't have any thresholds when uh, ordinary course of business transaction exemption would apply. Now, with respect to uh, share acquisition by underwriters, up to 25% of unsubscribed shares shall be considered uh, ordinary course. Anything beyond that will not be considered uh, in the ordinary course. Uh, similar, similar threshold for stock broker in case of uh, stock broking. In, in case of mutual funds, any acquisition above 10% would itself disallow application of ordinary course of business exemption then uh, the other popular exemption that we generally see uh, used by mostly private equity and financial sponsors is the solely uh, for an uh, for investment exemption that we have and uh, any acquisition up to 25% uh, you know not leading to acquisition of control continues to uh, be exempt the important nuance that uh, that has been added now is that uh, uh, instead of the previous special rights uh, criteria that we had, uh, now we have what is called uh, the access to commercially sensitive information uh, right. So as long as if the acquirer gets any uh, right which will allow it to gain access to commercially sensitive information in the target, uh, that would disallow solely for investment exemption now. And the previous criteria, the other criteria of having a director or observer position continues to stay there. But the change is uh, substitution of special rights uh, with commercially sensitive information. And, uh, I, you know, I, I believe that commercially sensitive information is a, a broader uh, right. And therefore, uh, you know, it will lead to less number of deals qualifying for uh, solely for investment test. And uh, there is also uh, now a clear objective criteria where there is a competitor acquisition or vertical slash complementary uh, acquisitions. In those cases, if you breach the 10% uh, share threshold, in that case, uh, you, uh, you will not be considered solely as an investment but the interesting point is that uh, uh, this this point is couched in an explanation and therefore it remains to be seen if cci will take any additional arguments from parties where uh, they are overall below that 25 percent limit and they, they have an argument to make that there is no acquisition of control so we'll have to watch that uh, area now, one additional exemption that we didn't have previously, that this is sort of the one unique exemption that we have now, which we didn't have, is, is on uh, demergers. Where, uh, so previously, uh, we had at least three, four cases before CCI, where, uh, you know, one of the, where uh, uh, one of the businesses were demerged uh, from the main entity 
and uh, there was mirror share holding in the resultant entity uh, but those cases led to uh, cci filing because they did not fall in any specific exemption now if you have exact mirror share holding in that demerged entity in the resultant entity uh, then you will now be able to get exemption as well for such kind of cases so this is quite welcome now if you move to the next slide uh, the other changes are pretty much in line with what we had previously uh, incremental acquisition of shareholding or voting rights pretty much play uh, play out the same way that it played out previously the only thing is that now they have a simpler language on how this exemption applies for example uh, they had previous criteria of uh, you know uh, threshold of change from uh, joint control to sole control uh, or acquisition of uh, uh, you know sole control now now that's changed to simply uh, that the transaction should not result in any change in control uh, this is a simpler stance and again adds to clarity and sort of uh, just uh, simply uh, makes the reading of the exemptions much better and lastly on the intra group transaction exemptions again these existed previously and they continue to exist now uh, pretty much the same way the again the changes uh, are limited to refining the language but uh, ultimately intra group acquisitions and intra group mergers and amalgamations would remain exempted the same way that they uh, were previously right uh, and the other question sorry uh, the other question that you asked on green channel uh, here i think the big change is uh, you know scope of affiliate so what the uh, commission uh, rather the mca has done is that uh, it has now come up with a new nuance of affiliates uh, so previously uh, for green channel applicability one would have to uh, check the uh, the acquirer and its group starting from ultimate parent entity on one hand and the target and its downstream group entities on the other hand to see whether there were any horizontal vertical or complementary overlaps now you will continue to do that uh, with respect to group but then you also need to check uh, whether the acquirer or the target have any affiliates uh, which exhibit overlaps and now there is a definition of affiliate uh, essentially uh, which which is on the screen that wherever the uh, entity has 10 percent or more in the other entity or right or ability to have representation on the board uh, as, as a director or an observer and lastly and uh, this is again something new right or ability to access commercially sensitive information of that entity now this adds a little bit of uncertainty to how green channel applies uh, because um, in financial sponsor deals private equity venture capital deals it's very routine for um, such entities to have certain degree of information rights in target and therefore whenever you run uh, overlaps check uh, whether there are horizontal complementary or, or uh, vertical overlaps uh, the breadth of enterprises that you wouldn't have to now include would significantly widen and therefore in a lot of transaction it appears that green channel route be will become unviable and uh, therefore a lot will depend on how cci actually interprets commercially sensitive information if it takes a overtly uh, narrow view uh, that uh, any form of information that uh, that an entity will have would amount to csi then this will practically uh, lead to lot less uh, green channel filings so but but on the other hand if cci is a little more creative and little more allowing uh, then then it can take a view that commercially sensitive information would only amount to information which are more strategic in nature and rather uh, uh, you know uh, sort of in contradistinction to in certain information that you only obtain to protect your investment if cci sort of makes that uh, distinction then then green channel route will continue to be uh, quite attractive for private equity uh, players as well so a lot to be seen in this area uh, in the future
Sticking with the with the concept of and in the entire uh, debate about financial sponsors and competition law, Anisha, over to you now. Uh, we've seen since the pandemic uh, started, you know, a bulk of transactions in the Indian uh, corporate space have been involving financial sponsors. Uh, they have been extremely active across sectors uh, pretty much since 2020-2021. Uh, be it uh, Indian private equity funds or even global ones. Uh, sovereign wealth funds and even you know pension funds uh, we've seen a fair bit of activity a lot of family offices as well now practically how do you see these recent uh, changes impacting financial sponsors as such and what really changes for them yeah th thanks thanks for that question uh, if you can just move to the next slide so um, i think just staying on with the, on the note that pranjal left at See, one is uh, from a financial sponsor perspective and covers the whole host, right? Um, Indian global um, pension funds, etc., uh, sovereign funds included. So, I think largely with the change in definition of what entities qualify as affiliates, what has happened is that the law is casting a wider net. And more number of entities where you have access to commercially sensitive information will become relevant for the purposes of an overlaps analysis, right? So you have to, the expanse of entities is becoming wider, which again correlates to what Pranjal said. So your probability, it's basic math, your probability of getting a green channel approval uh, reduces. So that's number one. And therefore, what I would recommend in that light is um, from a record keeping perspective, it may be the right time from an Indian law perspective also. And I know some of the global private equity um, who routinely world over make investments have, you know, a record keeping system where they have a list of all of their active portfolios, uh, what businesses they are engaged in, how much stake they hold, what kind of rights they have. And it's become important now uh, because when you have to file the merger notice, this kind of information is required. So either you start the process then where, where you will take a lot of time to collect the information or you already have a system ready today itself which can be regularly updated. Uh, right so i think increasingly become this is becoming more important because the bottleneck to merger filings uh is to collect information and more than the private equity fund itself uh a lot of information on port codes is required especially where overlaps are discovered right so that's one the second one is fund ownership structures uh in the last uh three to five years uh the sophistication of the ownership structures that we have seen in on our deals uh has become overly complex it is becoming harder to trace up to the value chain to see who is ultimately controlling uh entity who is ultimate parent entity of this group a lot of times they're also uh, limited partners who are supposedly only passive investors, but they are heavyweights in that space. And they also demand that they have certain um, suite of rights, uh, which from an Indian law perspective could amount to material influence, right? So all of these things are becoming important. The commission is also not shying away from calling for these documents to assess for themselves, uh, whether there is influence by uh, any other entity aside from who we position or disclose as a general partner or the manager of the investment fund, All right? And, and I think the last point is, again, India is also riding on that global wave where uh, in the US it is called private equity roll-up. Uh, I prefer the term serial acquisitions because it also... Uh, so it sort of rhymes with killer acquisitions, but uh, what's happening is if, if you know if anybody from uh, the US is here, uh, they would know that there is a clampdown on these roll ups. There are repeated multiple acquisitions made in the same sector, and those are also now supposed to be in the HSR form supposed to be disclosed, right? In India, also while we we don't have that specific terminology or anything explicitly in the law, but I believe that uh, the criteria for deal value and the fact that you have to 
look into all the interconnected transactions amongst the same groups is also sort of get, taking some inspiration from that uh, uh, sort of theme that we are seeing in, in the Western world uh, and, and something that CCI will look at. And on the same note, I'd say that in India also, there have been cases involving uh, financial sponsors who have multiple um, same sector investments and where the commission has again uh, accepted certain undertakings and behavioral commitments that they will not exchange information they will not have similar directors uh, with the intention that there is no softer coordination amongst those portfolios so common ownership risk uh, you know that to that extent is also something that the is on commission's radar and uh, the line of questioning uh, that the CSAP poses uh, when it's scrutinizing these kind of deals, you can you can tell uh, from from you know the, the fine print what they are uh, trying to target. Um, so you know some of the practical considerations. I think I've covered some of this in my previous slide, but. But another thing that sort of very often uh, is important to consider beforehand is when you're making an investment. Um, and this is relevant for strategics and financial sponsor alike how are you uh, how are you pitching the deal externally how are you publishing your press releases your media reports uh, your leadership how it is talking to the media about the deal uh, and all of these things is going to be ultimately used as evidence that the commission has uh, done in the past to see whether your previous investments in the same sector and the same company needs to be uh, looked at to, to aggregate you know your future investments amount to see whether your deal value is being met so this is very important and and therefore it becomes very important that you know your antitrust council is also playing a part uh, and reviewing these disclosures uh, before they are made public um, and, and the second thing again to just an extension of what Pranjal said uh, when you're negotiating rights if you want to get the benefit of uh, the solely as an investment exemption what's your rights package what kind of information rights which are previously perhaps kosher now are borderline uh, or fairly in, in, intrusive uh, whether that is going to trip and you will have to make a filing on that basis that becomes important inspection rights also is something that we see a lot of times in a lot of deal documentations and these are rights which now need to be looked at more carefully because potentially they can uh, that can disqualify you from an exemption that was uh, in the good old days probably available and behavioral commitments is something that i've already touched upon having information firewalls uh, dilution of rights in in port codes which are competing with each other are examples that we have seen in live cases involving large private equity players uh, and this is becoming commonplace uh, so to say and uh, internal documentation um, paperwork is very important uh, of course we are all lawyers so we will insist upon paperwork but it is also important because regulators are asking rightfully so sometimes for your internal documentation and whether what has been pitched and disclosed to them as the strategic rationale is actually aligned with what you know internally uh, you you all discuss and believe the rationale to be so it's very important and internal documentation in the context of interconnected transactions is also equally important to see whether you have notified the complete deal with all of its steps or there are some steps that you have closed and you're coming uh, for approval only for those steps that you believe is the true trigger so uh, you know these and 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 from a timeline perspective i think uh, now uh, india's 13 to 14 years of enforcement it's fairly matured uh, our firms are also very um, you know business information heavy it's now time that india for india also uh, just like how you know uh, large global funds sort of organize their documentation it's important that we have a recording system where all the information at least the you know headline information for port codes is readily available that will really help in expediting approval timelines putting the form together and you know uh, come closer to the finishing line to to get your regulatory approvals and all your ducks in a row back to you Anjuman. thank you Nisha. thanks so much for that uh... Keeping with the with the theme, uh, with another interesting theme which has been 
uh, which has been uh, the buzzword around uh, the world when it comes to competition law uh, is digital markets. Uh, Pranjal, coming to you uh, one last time again, uh, digital markets have been in focus around the world, uh, you know, across the globe uh, since the last uh, few years. Uh, do the latest set of amendments uh, bring in any change uh, in the manner in which uh, digital markets per se would be impacted and how would the merger control regime be really uh, impacted because of this? Thanks, Anshuman. And I think there's been a lot of talk about digital markets, digital transactions, etc. But we haven't seen a lot of uh, activity on the ground, uh, isn't it? So I think in terms of what the law is right now, uh, uh, you know, Anisha talked about this in great detail, the deal value threshold itself. So all we have right now in terms of MA and uh, scrutiny over uh, digital markets is, is that uh, added burden of looking at your deals from a deal value uh, lens and see if you trigger those thresholds. Uh, one uh, area where CCI seems to have specifically focused on digital markets is to, uh, is to have that additional criteria for digital services when looking at uh, local ne nexus, uh, you know, significant business operations in India test. And uh, from Anisha's previous explanation, probably you would recall that for digital services, a uh, significant business operation in India test only requires that you at least 10% of the users, be it end users or um, uh, business users, come from India. And there is no real, uh, there's no additional requirement of uh, a particular turnover from uh, India or particular GMV from India in that uh, respect. So essentially, it appears that, uh, you know, CCI is looking to scrutinize transactions where uh, the deal value is high and there are at least certain number of users in India comprising 10% of the global number. So as long as you, you sort of breach that uh, user spread test, uh, you would be scrutinized, scrutinized irrespective of the money that you are making in the country. So from that perspective, yes, digital transactions would be scrutinized. Uh, the other aspect, uh, you know, we, I think uh, several months back, uh, the buzzword was uh, the digital competition bill. And uh, right now it is sort of going through a lean patch. We will again see that coming up uh, sometime again. But uh, Importantly, digital competition bill, uh, bill does not talk about MNA at all. Uh, it, in fact, uh, through the uh, you know the meetings, the CDCL meetings, uh, it was clarified that uh, the deal value thresholds uh, that are being brought in would take care of any sort of risks associated with killer acquisitions or other kind of risks associated in tech MNAs, and there is no need for the a digital competition bill to specifically deal with MA related issues that arise out of uh, you know uh, digital markets so there wouldn't be uh, any any specific focus on digital MNAs in digital competition bill but we have the deal value thresholds of course where uh, uh, they can be scrutinized but thanks you know, Ranjan. thank you uh, Digital competition bill is, of course, something that I think all of us are, are keenly awaiting. Let's see how that pans out. Hopefully, in the next few months, we should have some more clarity on on what shape and form the law might take. Uh, but just coming to the to the trends that we are generally seeing this year, uh, before I go to Manasar again uh, for for uh, giving us a little bit of a strategic insight as to how we should deal with merger control going forward. Uh, we have seen roughly about uh, 98 to 100 filings this year, and uh, as as always, a majority of them have been in Form One. Uh, the number of filings this year has, in, in fact, actually gone up a fair bit. We have seen, we generally see about 100 or 110 filings uh, per year, and this year we've already hit close to 100 uh, in the month of October itself. So we might see a few more filings, which also gives a little bit of an insight as to how uh, you know extensive and uh, large, the deal-making activity really has been. Uh, the number of green channels, in fact, actually has has, has uh, gone down this year. Generally, we have seen, 
and as Franjal also mentioned previously, uh, we've seen about 25% of the of the transactions being notified through the green channel, but that number seems to have come down uh, a bit this year. Might have been because of uh, the, new, the new changes which are being brought about, but also because of the manner in which the commission has been advising during the PFC routes itself. Uh, so maybe we'll, we will see the, the number of green channel routes uh, go down going forward as well. Uh, if you see the, the kind of uh, sectors that we have seen deal activity in, it has been practically uh, a wide variety of sectors, uh, a large chunk in the financial services space, in digital IT and ITES as well, pharmaceutical, auto components and automobile, and of course, uh, power generation, transmission, distribution, uh, all being covered as well. Uh, we've seen one case involving uh, a gun jumping penalty in this year until now, and at least one order uh, which would have uh, certain conditional approvals coming through. So, uh, and as Manasar said previously as well, uh, we don't expect, uh, we haven't seen at least until now, uh, any, any cases being blocked. Manasar, this brings me to the last question to you as to, you know, how should clients uh, and parties generally prepare for engaging with the CCI, what should they really be keeping in mind uh, at all times uh, while engaging with the commission uh, on a transaction? And how do you generally on a more broader perspective uh, see merger control evolving further? Uh, would you see it to be in line with the rest of the world? Do you see there to be some divergence? Uh, what would your thoughts on this generally be? So thank you, Anshuman. <clears throat> what I feel is that the substantive provision of the Competition Act continues to have the opportunity for both the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and CCI to revise the thresholds from time to time. So now the thresholds have always been revised upwards from the time the merger control notifications were made in June of 2011. So keeping that in mind, I think even the deal value threshold of 2000 Indian currency crore of rupees or even the primary thresholds under section 5, they may also go upwards. So if that threshold revision goes upwards as per the trend we have seen in the last 14 years, I think that this gives an additional comfort to the filing parties that there would be perhaps again coming into existence of some more thresholds being uh, coming within the ambit of exemption. At the same time, we have seen in the newspaper today, the finance minister said that by 2027, we are going to reach $5 trillion economy. If that happens, obviously, you'll have more of merger filings happening in India because it will be a market where people would be interested in investing. So keeping that in mind, balancing that with the revision of thresholds, I think it would be definitely be a very, very viable market for uh, parties to come before CCI because end of the day, you know, combinations to my mind as of today, we have not seen any appeal jurisdiction being sitting over CCI's orders because maybe there was no blocking of transaction and it is a very happy kind of a situation so far as the transacting parties are concerned. So to that extent, my take on future would not be a great change that there would be a definitely a blocking of transaction as if it is something which the CCI must achieve. It's not like that because they have inbuilt created a system. And if I go by the exact regulations of our uh, competition rules, we have got 19.2 regulation, which says that prior to formation of the prima facie view, parties, if they so desire during the course of the pre-filing consultation, can give certain voluntary commitments to the CCI so as to ease the approval process easier. Same is also happening after formation of the prima facie view. They can also give some voluntary commitments. So those things keeping in mind, keeping in view of the Indian economy and the economic position coming in the next two years or three years, I think for industry, for parties to transaction, even for those who are uh, in the digital space, despite that the deal value threshold may perhaps be intended to capture those which had gone under the bridge during the time of the Facebook WhatsApp kind of a deal. Barring those, I personally feel the situation would not change much. Rather, the pressure on the CCI would be more to clear deals because end of the day, you know, merger control continues to be a non-adversarial efficiency enhancing business opportunity. And I don't think there would be any change with that because that is the classical principle of competition law. So to my mind, it's not so 
uh, alarming situation. Rather, the amendments to my mind has really made much more predictability rather than coming through the statutory combination regulations. It has now been part of the substantive law. And that, to my mind, gives much more clarity both to the parties and to the external councils. What I would like to really, from my own experience, I would like to suggest that if the parties to the deal are almost contemplating to go for a combination, they should start preparing for filing from day zero. Their preparation should be such that they should not give CCI much of a time to ask for more questions. If you can minimize RFIs, the clock would start ticking against the CCI and that would be your win-win situation. That's my personal experience, which I have experienced in 17 working days, a combination which we could get it of a competitor and it was a global deal. So I think it is possible, even, even now it is possible. So that's my last take on the issue. Great. We've already exceeded the, exceeded the time uh, when we have a bunch of questions uh, from, from, from the attendees as well. We'll try and cover those during uh, the next uh, day or so over email. Uh, but do reach out to us in case you have any additional questions on what you have what you have uh, seen and heard today. Uh, thank you so much for for taking out uh, time to attend this webinar, and and uh, we hope to connect with you again very soon. Thanks a lot.